Ladies and gentlemen, as it's now five past, I think we need to make a start. Let me begin by welcoming you to this um, information session. It's an annual event where some of my colleagues will come and tell you about some of the elective courses that are being offered in 2017. So elective courses are available to part three and part four students within the LLB. The number of elective courses that you take in the course of your LLB is not specified, it's a certain number of points that you have to accumulate, and as you probably know, elective courses come in different sizes. So we have the small 10 point, the medium 15 point, and the large 20 point electives. Um, you'll see from one of the handouts that we have academic staff coming to talk about 27 of the 50 elective courses that will be offered next year. So there will be four offered in the summer school. There are currently 20 scheduled for the first semester of next year and 26 for the second semester. Before um, individual teachers tell you about their particular courses for next year, either as a means of encouraging your interest or possibly of deterring you from enrolment, um, there are a number of general points that need to be made, so if you'll just bear with me for the next 14 minutes or so, there are the five things that are shown there following the word introduction, and there are three other generic matters for us to uh, address as well, just so that you have a context in which to consider each of the elective courses that's being presented to you. So the first is the structure of the LLB degree, and students sometimes, um, because they're perhaps mathematically challenged, or because they confuse what is meant by compulsory and what is meant by elective, find themselves at the end of part four 10 points short of their degree requirements and then some hasty footwork is needed or approval of a late supervised research paper or something to get them out of their dilemma and so that their ability to do profs won't be prejudiced, their ability to graduate in the next graduation ceremony won't be prejudiced as well. So in working out how many electives you need, I think what you need to do is look at parts three and four of the degree holistically. Within parts three and four, you need to take land, equity, jurisprudence, law 399, legal ethics, and law 499 or 498, and I'll explain 498 soon, but those are both zero point courses. And then elective courses which allow your total points for parts three and four to add up to 240. So we're talking about 120 points per part of the degree or 240 points for parts three and four combined. If within part two, you passed law 299. So if part two for you consisted of 120 points, criminal public torts contract and law 299, 120 points, then you need another 240 points to complete your degree. If you're one of those students who has come into part two this year and is undertaking law 298, which is worth 10 points, added to crimes, public torts and contract, that makes 130 points for part two as a whole, then the required total for parts three and four is not 240, but 230. In other words, if you've done 10 extra points in part two, because you've taken law 298, 10 fewer points to take later on in your degree, 10 fewer points in electives. So in doing the maths, and certainly the student advisors can assist if you're in any doubt about whether you're on track, um, you're working towards a total of 240 points across parts three and four, compulsory and elective courses combined, unless you've done 298, in which case the requirement is 230 points in total. Law 499 is called legal practice. It has no points associated with it. It is a device. It is a device by which the law faculty makes sure that students in the course of part three or four of their degree have participated in a compulsory moot in part three, or one of the limited alternative moots that are recognised, the Maori issues, the Pacific issues, and the family law moots. So the general moot, the Maori, the Pacific, or the family, and have written a number of assignments, written assignments of at least 1,500 words. Now it's hard to avoid those assignments since we introduced compulsory coursework into every elective. So almost inevitably, amongst your 11 or so elective courses that you choose, there will be at least five pieces of writing that you will have been doing of at least 1,500 words, and thereby you satisfy the requirements of Law 499. Law 498 is being introduced next year for students who will be commencing Part 3 in 2017 or later. 
And it differs from Law 499 in two respects. Firstly, there, are, there is a wider range of moots to choose from. So basically any moot beyond part two, not just the general faculty one, the Maori, the Pacific and the family, but any, including the competitive ones beyond part two, will satisfy the mooting requirement if you are enrolled under Law 498. The other difference is that rather than requiring five pieces of writing, of uh, short writing of 1,500 words, Law 498 will require one sustained piece of writing of a minimum of 4,000 words in the course of your degree, in the course of your electives. So for those that choose law, oh, students moving to part three next year must do law 498. Those of you who are already in part three or four have the option of either 499 or 498. Neither of them carries any points. 498 will give you a greater choice of moots but it does require a piece of sustained writing of at least 4,000 words. The, there are entries in your course descriptions booklet on page 19 explaining Law 498 and 499 and the requirements for both. Now there's one refinement and that is when this was drafted and went off to print two days ago, it said what the likely requirements would be for Law 498 but they are now confirmed. So it said, I think, a, uh, a sustained piece of writing of at least 4,000 words as a probable requirement, that's now confirmed it as an actual requirement. It also says that that piece of writing of 4,000 words can be satisfied in various ways. And those ways include completing a supervised research paper, a PILO, and we'll talk about those in a moment, the report for the community law project or the community law internship, and we'll talk about those, Research essay for a 15 or 30 point master's course, if you choose to include a master's course within your degree, and in a minute we'll talk about those possibilities. Any other single piece of writing of the required length, honest seminar papers and dissertations do not qualify. Cross out the word not. Honest seminars, papers and dissertations do qualify for Law 498. They involve sustained writing. Our concern is to signal to prospective employers that each law graduate of this law school will have done at least one piece of sustained writing of 4,000 words or more. Honours students will inevitably have done that through their honours requirements. LLB students have a variety of um, options, ways in which they can satisfy that requirement. So leading on to the next heading, Law 456, Supervised Research. There is an entry on page 63 in the booklet about supervised research. This is a 15-point elective, which is essentially an opportunity for any law student to investigate some area of law in which they're interested and to write a 10,000-word research paper under the supervision of one of my academic colleagues. It can be in any area of law whatsoever. So let's say you have a particular interest and it's not accommodated by any of the electives that we're offering. Then this is your opportunity to write about your area of interest. 10,000 words and to be supervised individually by a staff member. If you complete, if you adopt that option and complete your 10,000 word research paper, then you've relieved yourself of 15 points of electives that you otherwise would have had to do because the waiting for this elective is 15 points. Um, you've satisfied that extended writing requirement for Law 498 because you've written more than 4,000 words. And there is flexibility, not only in terms of the subject matter of your supervised research, but of the timing as well. So a supervised research paper can be completed in summer, or in the first semester, or in the second semester. Just so long as there's somebody who's available and willing to supervise it for you. Alright, if you have a look at the next page, page 64 in your course descriptions booklet, You'll see there, firstly, at the top half of page 64, an entry about PILOs, papers in lieu of, in lieu of what? In lieu of exam. So in any elective course that you are taking, as part of your LLB or LLB Honours degree, whether it's a 10 point, a 15 point or a 20 point, if that elective course involves a final examination at the end of the semester, you may apply in lieu of that examination to present a research paper. Now the length of the research paper, which will obviously be on a topic relevant to the course, will vary according to whether it's a 10 point, a 15 point or a 20 point elective. So again, if within a particular elective course there's something that you're passionate about or have a burning interest in and would like to pursue that and thereby avoid an exam at the end of the semester as well, 
then a paper in lieu of exam with the approval of the relevant teacher is a possibility. It's in respect of papers in lieu and only in respect of those that we insist on students attending classes. So if you're enrolled in any other elective, there's no obligation to attend um, lectures. But where there is a research paper in lieu of the exam that you are presenting, then you're required to attend so that you get reasonably broad coverage of the course and just don't focus on the one narrow aspect of the course about which you're writing your research paper. So again, a paper in lieu of exam will inevitably be a fourth, well, will nearly always be a 4,000 or more words and therefore it would satisfy that extended or sustained writing requirement also for Law 498 for those of you that may be enrolling in 498. Master's courses, brief entries again on page 64. And one of the handouts identifies for you the master's courses that may be considered by part four students for inclusion as electives within their LLB degree. So this year for the first time we encouraged part four students, that is students who had passed at least 120 points beyond part two, part two and another 120 points, and who had a B average in their last two semesters or in their last 120 points to be permitted to do one or two or even maybe even three master's courses as electives within the LLB. And that arrangement continues into next year, not for all master's courses, but for those that are listed on the sheet. So as it shows at the top, if the prerequisites to be able to include any of these in your LLB are that you've passed at least 120 points beyond part two, and that you have a GPA of five, that is a B average across your most recent 120 points of law studies. If so, then you could consider any of those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine master's courses that are listed, some of which are weighted as 30 points, some of which are weighted as 15 points. You may include up to 45 points of master's courses within your LLB, in which case they count as LLB electives. Some of the master's courses are taught intensively over three days or maybe five days. Others are semester long. None of them is assessed by way of exam. So if exams are not your thing, master's courses are an opportunity to avoid exams. They are assessed by way of research papers. For a 15 point master's course, a research paper of 6,500 words. For a 30 point master's course, a research paper of, or a research essay of 12,500 words. Either of those, of course, satisfies the sustained re writing requirement for Law 498. So if you are unimpressed by, let's say, the 20 elective courses that are being offered in the first semester next year, then you can consider that there are, in addition, five master's courses being offered in the first semester next year, which can be taken if you're a Part 4 student as part of your LLB degree. And if so, then you would get an opportunity with the teacher of the master's course to negotiate your particular topic within the master's course on which you'll be writing either 6,500 or 12,500 words, depending on whether it's a 15 or 30 point master's course. If we look at page 51 in the handbook, uh, the course descriptions booklet, you will see um, on the second half of page 51 an entry about Law General 447 Community Law Project and back on page 39, a similar entry for community law internship. These are opportunities to work with community organisations for 75 hours in respect of the project, for 150 hours in respect of the internship, to write either a 5,000 word reflective report on that experience or a 10,000 word reflective report for the project or the internship respectively, and they are electives worth 10 and 20 points respectively. So if there's a particular community organisation that you would like to work with, youth aid, victim support, whatever it may be, and you can arrange, or Sarangica on your behalf can arrange for you to spend 75 hours, then you can be credited with a 10 point elective subject to writing the report, or 20 points under the community law internship rubric subject to a 10,000 word report, and those reports of course are of sufficient length that they satisfy the sustained writing requirement for those that need to do that for Law 498. Okay, just two more generic comments and then 
Peter, you'll get your opportunity. Um, the first is that there are some new courses being offered next year that haven't been offered previously or are returning after an interval in a changed form. So this year there was no course in advocacy. Previously there was an elective course in advocacy. It was limited to 40 students. Typically about 70 or 80 students wanted to take it. Next year there will be two advocacy courses. In the first semester there will be trial advocacy, page 46 in your booklet. In the second semester, appellate advocacy, it's page 52. Each of them will be limited to 30 students in respect of trial advocacy to 40 students in respect of appellate advocacy. So in total, up to 70 students could be accommodated across those two courses. And both courses are being taught by teams from Meredith Connell. And each of those teams will be coordinated by somebody who will be the course director and responsible for the coherency of the course and so on. The other new development is a human rights clinic. This is clinical legal education, the, first, the law school's first uh, foray into this sort of um, elective course, other than the community projects and internships which we've mentioned. Andrew Erowetti will teach or coordinate this course and students will work collectively on some human rights project or projects, page 63 in your course descriptions booklet, for information about the Human Rights Clinic, though the information there is very sparse. It says, I think, just that this is a new course and details will be announced. The last point, general point, is that, as you may know, the Law School has advertised a number of academic vacancies and is hoping over the coming weeks to make a number of academic appointments. So some colleagues have departed for other pastures. Some will be departing, whether by way, well more often by way of retirement than any other course. In anticipation of those departures or imminent departures, there are a number of academic positions to be filled. If they are filled in sufficient time for the new appointees to be here next year, then there may be further elective courses offered to supplement the ones that we already know about. So regard the 20 shown for the first semester next year as a minimum number, there may be others. The 26 for the second semester next year as a minimum number, there may be others. And if there are others, we'll let you know about them as soon as we know about them. But there will be no increase in the four that are being offered in summer school. Any questions on any of those general matters before we turn to specifics? Yeah. Um, no, they're not. And one of the reasons that they're not is because often in part four students go on exchange and we wanted all students to have access to the advocacy courses. However, they are restricted as to numbers and so you might be interested in the selection criteria. So if there are more than 30 students wanting to do trial advocacy, if there are more than 40 students wanting to do appellate advocacy, then the selection criteria in each case are each student's GPA across the law courses that they've done to date and their expressed interest and ability in advocacy as shown by previous participation in mooting or other competitions. And those courses are not restricted against each other, so there's nothing that says you will necessarily be limited to one and have to make a choice whether it's trial or appellate advocacy. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, the Human Rights Clinic course, is yes. that proposed to be in semester one or semester two? Semester two, okay. if I need to give Andrew time to organise it. Um, so it will be in semester two. It will have, I think, uh, some lectures at the beginning, but then students will be briefed as to how they should act within the organisations that they're working with and so on. Um, the details of the assessment are still being worked out. You'll see, in fact, throughout the course descriptions booklet, um, that it's silent on the assessment arrangements for the elective courses. Now that's not because we haven't thought about them. In most cases the assessment arrangements have been pinned down, but in a few instances there are still some details to be settled before we can publish those. The only other general thing to say, of course, is that for those of you who are already secure in your place in law school and not in the competitive situation, enrolments for next year open on the first Monday of November, as they always do, so that's Monday the 7th of November. If you're in part three or four now, then you can enrol in your elective courses as from the 7th of next month. If you are currently in part two and moving to part three next year, you will not be able to enrol in any part three courses until we move you into the part three group 
and that will occur only in December when we've got all of the part two results and can confirm that you have in fact completed the part two requirements and we will move all such students together on block, en masse, so that none have a, a, a time advantage over others depending on when the last of the part two grades come in. All right, well if there's anything else generic, we can come back to it at the end. So now it's my pleasure to ask Peter, Professor Peter Devonshire to address you about the personal property elective. Okay, so personal property is a 10 point paper. There is a 750 word case comment and then a final exam. Uh, why would you want to take the course? Because when you take land law, you've taken one half of the property. The other half is personal property. Let me tell you very briefly what we'll cover. Uh, we'll cover the boundary between real and personal property. When has a chattel become land? And it played out in some important commercial litigation. You might be forgiven for thinking, why isn't it covered in a commercial lease or commercial conveyance? The answer is people forget it. So, boundary between real and personal property, we follow that on uh, with the consequences of possession. Much of the course is concerned with tangible personality. In other words, this is tangible personality, anything capable of being physically held. Uh, so we look at possession, we move to the finder's cases. Uh, you will find a lot of the topics resonate with your daily life. For example, you're taking you're in a field, somebody else's field, having a picnic, you see a shiny object, it's a gold fountain pen. And you think, I'd like that. The owner isn't in the picture, so you're the finder. However, the farmer looks over the hedge and says, give it to me. The question is, do you? And what will be the consequences if you don't? OK, that sort of very practical orientation. We have a couple of classes on the Personal Property Securities Act, which is a major piece of legislation. The remainder of the course will be on bailment. Bailment is an everyday event. We're all bailees. In other words, bailment arises when one person is in possession of the goods of another. So if I give you this, you become my bailee. Huge and significant consequences flow from that. It could be a personal relationship, it could be a complex commercial one. The principles will be largely the same. Uh, the feedback that I've got from the course is that people find it incredibly useful, incredibly valuable, just in their daily lives as lay people as well as lawyers. Okay, any questions arising? And if none, uh, we move on to Rowan Havelock. Thank you, Peter. So the entry for personal property was on page 32, and for the next course, page 35 in your booklet. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Rowan. Um, next year, in semester two, uh, I'm taking a course which is entitled Aspects of Insurance Law. Uh, this is a 10-point uh, paper, uh, two hours a week of lectures. Um, the assessment will be by way of um, a final exam and a uh, compulsory um, opinion. Uh, the course will cover um, the essential aspects of insurance law. Um, I've listed them in the uh, course uh, handbook. Uh, we'll start by looking at uh, the history of insurance uh, and insurance law, uh, then move on to the duty of utmost good faith, duty which uh, an insured has at the time they uh, take out insurance to disclose uh, material facts. Uh, to the insurer and not make a misrepresentation. Uh, we'll then move on to how an insurance policy is interpreted, uh, the scope of cover, uh, the content and effect of warranties and conditions, uh, the claims process and fraudulent claims, and finally uh, how the insurer's obligations are quantified. So why might you consider taking this paper? Well, um, I'll give you four reasons. First is uh, that insurance is uh, highly important uh, in uh, legal practice, uh, particularly if you're thinking about uh, practicing litigation. Uh, often insurers will be uh, found behind uh, commercial parties and therefore understanding of insurance law uh, is, is of a real advantage 
uh, in the context of litigation. Uh, secondly, uh, learning insurance law will reinforce uh, knowledge and skills uh, from the foundational subjects such as contract law, uh, because insurance law is essentially a, uh, a mix of contract law and uh, more specific principles and legislation uh, deal, dealing specifically with insurance. Uh, thirdly, uh, the course will have a very practical um, focus. Um, I'll spend some lectures uh, going over uh, typical insurance law problems, including past examination problems. Uh, so it won't simply be uh, ordinary lectures, there'll be a mix of lectures and more practical workshops. And the final reason is, is a monetary one. There is a prize of $1,000 if you come first. So um, for those reasons, I'd encourage you to consider taking insurance law, and I um, look forward to seeing some of you there. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Law and IT is the next page 30 in your course descriptions booklet. Judge Harvey. Thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, law and IT, Lawcom 426, is a 15-point uh, paper. There is an exam. It's an open book exam. Uh, and it's all about tech. Um, if you code, that's an advantage. Uh, when you think of the law, most of it's if-then statements anyway. So uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, we look at all sorts of things. Uh, some new stuff that we'll be looking at next year will be uh, implications of blockchain on smart contracting and whether or not you're going to need to know how to code and what code means when it comes to contractual interpretation because it's a new world. Uh, we will be looking at legal expert systems and how to do yourself out of a job by divining, uh, d designing software applications that at least will simplify many of the processes. What we are presently in and as we stand here, we are in what I call kinetic space. Uh, we touch, we talk, we're present, physically present with one another. Uh, information technologies allow for kinetic space to dissolve. <coughs> so instead of a courtroom being a place, in fact court becomes a service uh, that is offered. The way in which legal services can be provided, the way in which the law and legal advice can be provided can be commoditized as a result of information technology systems. Underneath all of this, of course, is the internet. And there are issues that we'll be looking at like governance systems, uh, who runs the domain name space, how, why, and whether or not it shouldn't be changed. Uh, how to engage in criminal behaviour online and how not to get away with it because we'll be looking at s computer searches and surveillance and all of that type of stuff. We cover pretty much the entire law course in a sort of overall way, seeing how information technologies impact upon it. Um, I see that there are some of my former students from this year here. Uh, they'll tell you if I'm misrepresenting it. Uh, I find it a lot of fun to teach, and I hope that my students find it a lot of fun to attend. Um, any questions? I'll see you all there. <laughs> Thank you. So next up to Caroline Foster, International Law, that's page 54, and Advanced International Law, page 62. Hello everybody, I'm Caroline Foster. Um, I'm a South Islander. I have two primary school age children, so I've had a very busy 10 years. Um, what I think I might do is tell you about both of the courses and then see if you have any questions about either course. So let's start with international law. Uh, okay, so we're on page 54 of the booklet, as, uh, as Stephen said. Um, it's a 20-point course, so it's four hours a week, normally split into two days. And we cover the basics of the whole system of public international law. So we look at things like what are the sources of international law, for example, treaties which we look at in some depth and how you interpret them. We also look, at, for instance, at the work of international courts and tribunals. And then in the last few weeks of the course, we do quite a lot of intensive work on use of force, where we look at the use of force uh, by other states in Iraq and in Afghanistan, uh, but also most recently, of course, in Syria, including against ISIS, and also uh, in the um, Crimean Peninsula and the Ukraine, which, as you might know, was taken over by Russia not so long ago. 
Uh, and then we generally make a few observations about how those rules on use of force might apply uh, in the cyber domain, um, which poses some, some really interesting questions. Uh, the teaching methods are, uh, I give you readings and I give you questions on those, which I usually email out after class each time. Um, we also spend some time in class planning out exam answers, so sketching out how you would um, you know, plan your answer to an exam question. And in the last three two-hour classes of the course, we do workshops uh, on those um, countries where we've been looking at the rules on use of force. The assessment, as you'll see, is 75% by the exam, so that's a two-hour exam, uh, and 25% by a test partway through, which is a one-hour test. So that's public international law, the basic rules, and some use of force. Now, in aspects of advanced international law, uh, we deal with more selective topics that actually really rather contrast with what we cover in basic public international law. So I'm now on page 62 of the booklets. Uh, as you will see, it's a 10-point course, so it is only uh, one two-hour block a week. And it is offered in the second semester, whereas uh, the public international law course is in the first semester. But you do have to have done the public international law course to do the advanced international law course. Uh, I thought it might be useful just to mention um, that um, because it can, I, I, they're probably unexchanged students here actually, so I'll leave that out, but you'll see it in the, in, the, um, in the program. Let me tell you a bit more about the course. Okay, so content. Um, the purpose of this course is essentially to look at practical problems that cross different subfields of international law. So use of force is one subfield of international law, but if you think about it, there are lots of other subfields. So there's trade, there's environment, there's human rights, there's investment protection, and the list goes on. And ideally, we want you to develop some skills at dealing with a practical problem that might cut across quite a few of those different areas. So first of all, we develop some, some familiarity with those different areas, and then we'll take a problem uh, and we'll look at how you actually might apply those different areas together. So you can see why you need your basic international law skills to start with. You need to know what a treaty is and how you interpret it and so forth. To give you an example of some of the sorts of cross-cutting issues that we've looked at before, we have looked at um, subsidies in the fisheries industry and how that can incentivise overfishing, leading to depletion of the fish stocks in the world's oceans. So that deals with issues that relate to trade because it's subsidies and also environment and also law of the sea. And in some cases human rights because many countries actually depend on fish protein for food. Another example is the uh, debate that is raging over what you can put on the packets to sell cigarettes, whether you can eliminate a lot of the branding and instead require these horrible disgusting images to put people off smoking. Trade, investment, uh, intellectual property, um, human rights and health issues. A couple of examples. Maybe corporate social responsibility is, is another example. Um, so you've got a description of it in your brochure. Um, the assessment will be a mixture of class participation and the examination, heavily weighted in favour of the examination, but I should tell you that we will be doing uh, workshops also uh, on each of the general subject areas before the exam, so um, you, you have a good level of comfort going into it. Um, it is a challenging course and it, it does require um, concerted effort and input every class where I call on different students to contribute and I think people have welcomed that and have feedback that they, they get quite a lot out of it. Do I have time to take a question? No. No? Nope. Sorry. <laughs> Hope to see you next year. Thank you Caroline. Um, the timetable details for all these courses are at the front of the book at pages four to seven. The next course is Guarantees and Indemnities. The information for that is on page 32. Michael Edmund. Stephen. Hi, um, I thought I'd uh, first talk about the mechanics of the course and then why you'd want to do it. Um, it's a summer school offering and it's um, done over eight three hour lectures. Um, three hour lectures are hard but that's the, um, you have a limited choice in summer school but we take a break every hour. Um, on the plus side this year it doesn't start till the 24th, um, just through cramming the lectures in so you get a little bit more um, holiday. Now the assessment will be, there'll be a multi-choice exam, 
and the rest of it will be a closed book um, exam at the end of it that will be two hours. Um, now as far as the course goes, it's, um, has anyone done it before here, out of interest? It's been a couple of years since I've taught it, but it's a subset of contract. Um, it guarantees just a secondary obligation uh, if you need to get an overdraft or something like that. Uh, the bank will be more than happy to give it to you, but they'll want a guarantee from your parents. So uh, that's the context that it um, arises in. Um, now why should you do it? It's an essential commercial subject. Um, if you're practicing as a lawyer, uh, having a knowledge of the formal requirements around the guarantee, it's like a contract for the sale of land. You need to do it. Um, if you end up in court and don't know it, judges expect you to. Okay. Um, it's, as it's a subset of contract, we'll go through um, contractual requirements. A again, it's a um, fair part of the course, so it's a good refresher for that as well. Um, and personally speaking, I was an undergrad uh, until 1991, so I found it useful having to go back and um, uh, refresh myself on what the requirements of a contract are. Um, I tend to be very practical in the way I teach it. I work as a barrister, this is the only subject I teach. So um, it, it's, for me, I mean laws about clients. You know, I have to justify myself to clients every day. Um, occasionally I have to go over to the courts. Uh, judges see my written work and I have to justify myself to them as well and advocate for my clients. So um, for me, it starts with them. Um, they're the punters and they're paying my, paying my bills. Uh, and they're the pe um, they're the people uh, to who law is important, and I think it's important not to lose sight of that. Um, I'm passionate about what I teach. Um, I really enjoy it. I had a year off last year, so we're to go in it. Um, now, what I do during the class is, and I'll do it more and more, is have problem questions. Okay, so it's, um, I've found that it works. Uh, it just breaks up the monotony, frankly. Um, and it just means that you go back and it helps you reinforce your learning. Um, what I'll be doing next time is probably uh, less of an emphasis on the case law and more problem questions. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we go, go through it at a fairly slow pace. Um, everyone sort of is, uh, takes in what's being taught and you understand it. Um, and if you do that, you should do very well on the exam. Um, what I'll also do is give you uh, tips on writing and things like that through the course. Um, as I said, there is an internal assessment component, but the main part of it will be your exam, and to write a good exam paper, you've got to write well. Um, it's a skill that you learn through law school, but when you get to doing what I do, it's um, just cardinal, okay? It's a cornerstone of what you have to do. So um, I'll be talking about courses I've done and just the skills I've acquired over time where you have to set out your argument clearly, okay? Um, and uh, it's being able to do that, it's just an essential that you'll need to develop now and have throughout your career if you're to be um, effective. So as I said, um, didn't do it last year, but really enjoy, uh, looking forward to getting into it next year um, and hope to see you there. Um, are there any questions? Thanks, guys. Thanks for the so next, Dr. Jane Norton, uh, to talk about two courses, Rights and Freedoms, that's page 56 in your booklet, and Administrative Law, which Jane, you're co-teaching with Janet McLean, and that is page 53. Alright, so a slight change is that Janet McLean is going to talk about Administrative Law, oh, if that's right. Um, Janet and I are going to talk, uh, teach Administrative Law together, which will be really fun. We plan to make it really fun. Um, and we're not just going to be looking at judicial review, we're going to be looking at administrative decision making, so how administrative bodies make decisions. But the main course that uh, I'm teaching, so I'm co-teaching admin with Janet McLean, the main uh, elective that I'm teaching just by myself is Rights and Freedoms next year. So I probably know many of you from equity, uh, but I also have an interest in, in uh, theory and also uh, the theory of human rights. So Rights and Freedom is a course that I inherited from Paul Rishworth and I've made some changes to it. Uh, we start by looking at the theory of human rights, so what is a right? Uh, so I build on some of the knowledge that you'll have from jurisprudence. And then we look at what is a human right. So what do we mean when we talk about human rights and how they can be justified? So one of the questions I get the students to think about is does it, can we really have human rights if we don't uh, believe in God? So where do these, these rights come from? 
And then we move on to look at the limitations that are placed on human rights, and then we start to look at some some case studies from the United States, from New Zealand, from South Africa, from India, from the UK, uh, and from the European Court of Human Rights. And we look at uh, case studies on torture, uh, religious freedom, freedom of expression, and we also look, we end the course by looking at socioeconomic rights. Now, uh, to take this course, I uh, have a particular uh, vision for this course, and that is that all my students are to uh, be independent learners and to think critically. So I'm, I'm very, uh, I very much try to dissuade the students from just sitting there passively and uh, then getting to the exam and just writing down everything that I say. In fact, you won't do well in that course. What I want you to do, and I'm, I'm pretty generous when it comes to the exam and assessment, I really want you to explore the areas that you find interesting and um, base your assessment around that. Um, and that's you need to read a lot and you need to think a lot and uh, if you don't like doing that then please don't take rights and freedoms because I'll end up dealing with lots of complaints from you or you'll end up pulling out in the first two weeks so if you enjoy reading and you enjoy think, thinking critically and if you enjoy not just regurgitating what the person in front of you says uh, then you'll love my course um, the assessment is 80% exam and then 20% a discussion paper and in the discussion paper you're expected to read, do the reading and then critically respond to the reading. So again, if you find that difficult or you don't enjoy that, then this won't be a course that you'll enjoy. But otherwise, I think most of the students who took it this year had a, had a good time. Um, so that's me. Thank you. So next, Nina Corey will talk about evidence and negotiation, which you're not actually teaching. No, <laughs> but that's fine. So those are pages uh, 38 and 42, respectively. Hi everyone, some of you I know, some of you I don't. Uh, my name is Nina Kuri. I uh, teach the dispute resolution courses here at the law school, undergrad and postgraduate and evidence. I have a background in civil litigation practice. These days I am teaching here at the law school and continue my private practice as a mediator. So uh, I am going to talk to you very briefly about the evidence course, uh, which I teach in the first semester and my colleague Scott Optikin teaches in the second semester. And I'm also going to talk to you about the negotiation, mediation and dispute resolution course, which I have taught for the last couple of years, but next year uh, will be taught by um, a New Zealander colleague of mine who's recently returned from Singapore, Ian McDuff. So there is a limit to what I can tell you about that second course because I don't know what changes he will make, but I can tell you the broad outline. <clears throat> so I propose to tell you in the three minutes I have allocated for each course, what the subject is, why you might like to do it, uh, how the classes run, and what the assessment is. So let's start with evidence. Uh, evidence is the rules governing the admission of evidence into court proceedings. So uh, both in criminal proceedings and in civil proceedings. It is largely governed now, happily, by one statute, the Evidence Act 2006. And what we do in the course is take the seven broad fundamental building block topics <coughs> and learn how the Act works <coughs> in practice for those topics. So you'll see them listed in the handout, um, the handbook. Uh, I don't need to go through them, but if you think that you might ever go anywhere near a courtroom, then you should treat this course as compulsory. Okay? It's, it's pretty much uh, where it's at when it comes to evidence. So they tend to be big classes uh, and they're treated by the law school as quasi-compulsory courses because they really are foundational subjects. Uh, it's a foundational subject in a law degree. Uh, how uh, I run the course, well, with a course like this, it would be really easy to just, in a really boring way, go through the Evidence Act and tell you this is the section, this is how it applies, and so on. So both Scott and I try to move away from that. And so, yes, you need to know those rules. You then need to know how to apply them. Okay? And it's a little bit like riding a bike. You can learn all the theory, but you don't know how to do it until you actually do it. So what we both tend to do is talk about um, what the law is, uh, talk about how it's applied in practice with cases, and then actually get stuck in and do problems. And we do those through past exam questions, um, done almost tutorial style in class. Uh, the, we also talk about some of the deeper policy questions, and with evidence, it kind of goes as deep as you want to go, really right down to what the justice system is about and what the rules of evidence say about that. Uh, and even if you want to go further, it's how do we know what we think we know? 
and then you can get distracted by all sorts of conversations about the stake and the matrix and all those sorts of things, right? So uh, the other purpose of the evidence course is really uh, practicing your logical reasoning skills. And really that's what evidential reasoning is about. So our goal in teaching it is to get those cogs in your brain well oiled uh, and uh, well practiced because this stuff moves fast in court and you need to know the answer quickly. That's evidence. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, the negotiation, mediation and dispute resolution course. Uh, in all common law jurisdictions with which we compare ourselves, somewhere between 90, 90 and 98% of civil proceedings filed never go to trial. So the vast majority of your practice, if you're going to go into any form of civil litigation, or family law, or employment law, is going to be about all that stuff that happens out of court. If you're going into transactional work, you need to be able to negotiate. And if you're not planning on practicing law at all, chances are you're going to do something else that requires you to think critically and negotiate. And that's what this course is all about preparing you to do. So we look at theory and practice of negotiation, mediation, and other forms of dispute resolution. Uh, and the assessment in uh, past years has been a, a mix of theory and practice with some research components, a group presentation component, and some reflective work uh, about negotiation uh, skills. I don't know what will be uh, the case next year, so you need to just um, keep an eye out for that. In terms of evidence as assessment, I realize I didn't cover that. Uh, Scott and I do it differently. Scott has a three-hour final exam and a compulsory opinion. I have this year for the first time changed it and I expect to, I will continue that next year to have instead of a three hour final exam, there will be a one hour midterm test that covers roughly the material up to that point, a two hour final exam which covers the remainder of the material, okay, so that you don't have to double up, and then a 10% case brief uh, where you have three options spread with different deadlines throughout the semester. And that should be self-explanatory about why I think that's a good model. Okay. Yeah. Are all of your evidence tests open book? Yes. Yep, absolutely open book. It's really, I'm not interested in whether you can memorize this stuff. I want to know what you can do with it. Good question. Yeah, Karen? Is the um, witness examination confidential part of that course? I'm sorry? Um, is the witness examination? No. no. Same, obviously overlaps in terms of content, but not part of the course at all. No. Uh, and both of us uh, try and make it interesting, and we expect participation from the class. It makes it much more fun for everyone, and we'll throw out some controversial stuff. It's just how both of us teach. But you can ask people about that. Okay. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Timely arrival by Paul Sumter. So Paul's course is uh, intellectual property, the details of which are in your booklet at page 25. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm rushing a bit because we're going to teach it now at 3 o'clock. So basically... Uh, uh, by the mic, if you would. Once oh, You've been recorded. <laughs> I've been recorded. Yes. Been recorded, OK. Um, intellectual property, like love, is all around us. So <laughs> it's, it's relevant and it's interesting. It's highly significant in commercial life, but it also touches on other areas like the arts and music and the <coughs> and so on. The course actually covers then copyright law, trademark law, including the tort of passing off, protection of confidential information, including private secrets, and it does cover also patents and registered designs. Yes, regrettably, there is an exam, a three-hour exam, it's 90%, 10% elective essay. And I welcome questions. As a practicing lawyer, I try and make it as realistic as possible. There are some interesting academic little highways and byways, but I try and tie it to what you might encounter as practicing lawyers. So, welcome questions. Super. I look forward to possibly seeing you next year. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Craig Allen will talk about international tax, the details of which are on page 34.
Great. So, um, such a streamlined organisation, Stephen. It's fantastic. Uh, thank you, Will. International Tax. Um, international Tax is one of three tax papers that you can do uh, that makes Auckland University by a country mile uh, the best place if you're interested in specialising in tax uh, because there really isn't any uh, other uh, institution up and down the country that has anywhere near that uh, level of, uh, of um, uh, focus on this topic. It's a great career, tax, by the way. Not only is it very remunerative, um, it's also intellectually very demanding. Uh, and uh, international tax is, of course, uh, relevant. It's been in the headlines like a heck of a lot in the last period of time. If you think back on multinationals avoiding tax and uh, what the government's response has been to that and the OECD. Uh, if you think about the Panama Papers and the naming of New Zealand and its foreign trust regime, that's another area. That, uh, so um, what, we, what we do in the course is it's a 15 point uh, uh, course. We've got a three hour exam. Uh, it's a bit like, uh, like, like uh, Paul's one. We focus very much on uh, practical issues. Uh, just a few years back, I was a tax partner at Chapman Trip. Um, so we tend to use examples that are based in, uh, in relevant real world situations. For instance, uh, last year's opinion was on a cross border shipping uh, lease and the implications under the Singapore, New Zealand, uh, and the um, there was another country as well too, which I can't remember what it is quite now. But anyway, we were, we, we were looking at those implications and how the Double Tax Treaty works. So, uh, to whom would this appeal? Um, I think anyone who wants to specialise in tax would find this very useful. Um, uh, basically, you don't get tax practice without international transactions nowadays. Even small and middle-sized organisations have transactions that are occurring in Australia. Just simply, the days of um, turning to an expert uh, and thinking that they had to use a double tax treaty just doesn't exist. It is, it's there for everyone. Uh, but if you're, not a, if you're more a generalist and don't actually want to specialise in tax, I still think it would be um, amazingly uh, useful. Uh, in fact, not this year, but the preceding year, uh, when uh, some students did it without having done the basic tax course, uh, they actually passed extremely well. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because uh, being an international law topic, it involves the interpretation of tax treaties. It's, a, it's a, effectively the role of soft law, the OECD commentary, and how you interpret it. So it's actually a course about interpretation. Um, so don't be put off. Uh, there are, if you're scared of numbers, this is a number-friendly course. Um, uh, it, it doesn't, you don't need numbers to understand uh, tax um, and uh, this is much more about uh, the law and the OECD interpretation. So please don't be worried if you haven't done tax before. Uh, you don't need that prior experience. Uh, you can simply do it independently of that and what, it's, what value would it have to you then? Um, I think it would be a very good example of an international subject that you can use um, and you can use in commercial uh, negotiations. Uh, it will also give you a window on the tax world uh, in a different way, without necessarily, if you don't, if you don't want to be sort of full on uh, into uh, into into tax practice. Uh, I'm not quite sure how much time I've got, Stephen. But uh, uh, we're just about out of time. We are just about out of time. time. Work question or two, okay. Well, maybe maybe that would be uh, that would be a better way to deal with it. So please don't be worried if you if you if you are scared about the idea that you need to do the other tax papers. You don't. You can do it. Uh, alternatively, if you're mad keen on tax, like I would have been at your age. Uh, you'd, you'd, you'd do all three. That's that would, be, <laughs> that would be my recommendation. But Michael, tell me about other two when that when those. Are so, any questions at all? I bet you're feeling bombarded with information. Um, but anyway, it's. Uh, I, I'll look forward to seeing some of you, hopefully, uh, in the first semester. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now resume, and we resume with the Professor. With Professor David Williams, who talk about two courses, legal history and contemporary treaty issues. Okay, kia ora koutou. Um, so I'm the said David Williams, one of them anyway. There's a few David Williamses in the world. I'm not David A. R. Williams QC, um, but I am David Williams. And I'm teaching <laughs> two courses uh, next year in the second semester. Um, and most of the courses you'll study are all legal history courses. 
because by the time you finish your degree and go and put your degree into practice, there will be a new court precedent that will have come out, there will be a new act of parliament that will have come out, and what you'll be putting into place uh, is, is the law in place at the time, uh, but uh, uh, it'll be what you learned at university will have an element of history. But if you want some real history, you want to go back in time and find out what it's like to hang, draw and quarter people on their way to their deaths, um, then this is the course for you. Witchcraft is uh, something that captivates people um, and, um, and usually they don't have a very good ending. Um, and uh, why was that? And what did people think they were doing when they were doing witchcraft? Why did they execute King Charles I? What had he done wrong? Um, he thought he could rule the country and other people said, no, you should have us to help you along the way. That's a public law oriented course. You've got the uh, choice next year. I see that um, my colleague um, Warren Swain is teaching uh, aspects of legal history. He's, a, he's very much a private law man, uh, teaching contract uh, law history in particular. I'm much more a public law man teaching uh, uh, some of the ways in which we've got the type of constitutional law that we've got today. Uh, but where does it all come from? One of the other themes of, of, of the course that I teach is legal pluralism. A lot of people say, you know, we should have one law for all. Um, all New Zealanders should be under one law. Well, the English common law was not made up of one law. It came from the law merchant, it came from canon law, it came from Roman law, it came from um, uh, folk law of the Anglo-Saxon uh, kingdoms, uh, it came from Norman feudal impositions, it came from a whole variety of sources and got melded into a great mixture uh, of stuff that we now teach in, in, uh, in New Zealand as part of the New Zealand common law. Uh, and it's quite interesting to just look at some of those, those uh, things in the background. Um, and if you say, why do, you, why do we really want to know about moral panics, about witchcraft or in, the, in the 17th century or, or whatever else it is, the person you should really take notice of is not Scott Optigan, it's, um, it's uh, uh, a man called Mark Twain, at least that was his um, writing name. Samuel Clemens was his real name, and he said, um, history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme a lot. So you know, any, anything that's happened in the world of previous legal history uh, is bound to happen again in one way or another. If you're interested in moral panics and witchcraft, you might be interested in international terrorism law in the 21st century. The second course that I'm speaking for, course director, is um, Andrew Edoetti, uh, and uh, he and I will be teaching the contemporary treaty issues course. This is indeed contemporary. Uh, this is treaty issues as of now in Aotearoa. Uh, and uh, uh, Andrew's uh, focus will be primarily on uh, uh, comparative jurisprudence of treaties between indigenous peoples and colonial powers. Um, uh, he's he, he's uh, done uh, uh, quite a lot of work on uh, all, all the various international conventions that are rel relevant to indigenous people's rights, especially, of course, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, my part of the, um, of the mixture is primarily the treaty settlement process. Um, some of the people who have been teaching this course this year, uh, I've been teaching it this year, and they've gone along to Kylie Quince and says, who's that old white fella? Uh, he seems to know a whole lot of stuff about this treaty stuff. I say, well, I'm the old white fella, uh, and I've been involved in treaty stuff since the Bastion Point occupation at, at, uh, at uh, uh, Orake in 1977. Um, I've got a few convictions to my name of a criminal sort, um, <laughs> but, uh, and I've got a few convictions uh, of a, a legal and scholastic sort. Uh, and if you come to one of those two classes, you'll get uh, some idea of what they might be, and you'll make up your own mind as to what you think about them. So, kia ora koutou. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, Scott. Yes, please. So, next course, Criminal Procedure, Scott Optican, page 58 in your book. Uh, I don't have any criminal convictions, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I'm still young and I'm still hoping, so there's still time. Uh, my name is Scott Optigan, Associate Professor. I also teach evidence, but Nina Corey talked to you about evidence. Uh, so she teaches one semester, I teach that and the other, but you've already heard about that, so uh, nothing to say there, but I am the other teacher of evidence. Criminal Procedure, um, it's a, a three hour a week course, two hour a week final exam, all courses and materials done by me. Criminal Procedure with a writing assignment that's worth X percentage for the class. 
A criminal procedure is the study of two things, um, criminal investigation and then criminal trial process. Uh, on the criminal investigation side, we study police powers, search and seizure, uh, police questioning practices, um, and various other aspects related uh, to policing. Uh, on the criminal adjudication side, the trial side, we study fair trial rights, the right to a jury trial, right to adequate time and facilities to prepare a defense, right to be present, right to cross-examine witnesses, etc. So the course is divided up a little bit between criminal investigation, which is the main focus, and criminal adjudication. It covers topics such as search and seizure, police questioning, the right to silence, the right to counsel, um, land transport act stops, uh, and uh, various criminal uh, procedural rights at trial, such as, as I said, the right to examine witnesses, fair trial rights, um, media bias, uh, jury selection, and things like that. Um, it's a good course, definitely, I would say, kind of a must-take course for anybody who wants to get into the criminal law business, either as a prosecutor, defense lawyer, uh, or maybe someone who wants to deal with criminal law and policy. I, myself, am a former prosecutor and studied criminology and various criminal justice issues. That's how I got interested in it. Um, if you're not actually interested in getting into the business, either as a prosecutor, defense lawyer, or someone connected with criminal justice, but you're just interested in a course on basic concepts of police powers, criminal trial process, and criminal investigation, the rules that govern that, um, it will be an interesting course for you. So it's for one or both of those kinds of people, um, someone who's going to be actually in the business and wants to learn the law of uh, police powers, criminal investigation, criminal adjudication, and then someone who just wants to take one course in that area um, out, out of interest. And that's uh, basically it. So any more questions, you know where to find me. Other than that, I thought I said that already. It's a, it's a two hour final two hour final exam plus a written assignment worth, I think, 20%, uh, 1,500 word written assignment. All course materials done by me, relevant statutes of the Search and Surveillance Act, Criminal Procedure Act, Juries Act, and of course, sections 21 to 25 of the New Zealand Bill of Rights. Any questions? All right, Great. thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Arne Hirschfeld next, um, Commercial Law, that's page 22 in your booklet. Um, kia ora everyone. So I'm Arne Hirschfeld and I teach the Commercial Law course. So the other day I bought a pair of, well, a set of chairs at Freedom. You might think, okay, nice, good for you. Um, but so here's the question, when did I become the owner? When I signed a contract, when I pushed OK and signed on the um, on uh, the visa card, or when they labeled the boxes with my name, or when they actually delivered these chairs to my house. When did I become the owner? So that's a question that we'll discuss in the commercial law course. And um, we'll look at the sale of goods act. We'll look at when property actually transfers. Now what if in a few weeks from now, hopefully not, but what if there's a problem with these chairs? It, and there's nothing in the contract. Does that mean I have no rights at all? Um, can I make a complaint and say, hey, these were really rubbish chairs that you sold me. Do I have any rights under the relevant legislation? So that's another thing that we'll look at under the Sale of Goods Act and as well under the Consumer Guarantees Act, which has significantly changed the Sale of Goods Act um, compared with at least for consumer goods. And then we'll look at the Fair Trading Act, which stops traders from being naughty and saying things that are untrue or creating the impression that things are better than they really are. So that's what we do in the first half of the class. After that, we look at the Personal Property and Securities Act, which might sound very strange, but is basically the act that governs all security interests that are given in personal property. So maybe the shop where I bought these um, chairs had given a security interest to the bank that said, well, you know, if we don't pay, you can come and get all our inventory. Um, well, if they sell that to me, is that still subject to that security interest? So those are all sort of questions that we deal with um, in the second part of the class. So a very large um, range of topics, all s related to commercial um, transactions. Um, assessment, I haven't quite made up my mind. I'm sort of seeing how this year works out. This year has been a bit of an experiment. So what I've done this time was a thousand word assignment and a for 10%, 10% multiple choice 
um, test that was a few weeks ago, and I see a few of my students were probably a little bit traumatized by that. Um, <laughs> so we'll see if I do that again. Um, and 80% uh, three hour exam. So if you have, have any questions? Great, then I'll hand you over to Tressa. So Laura just done the summer school course details on page 61. Thank you, and um, can I just tell you, when I was at law school, commercial law was by far the most useful subject that I, stu <laughs> that I studied. Which is why you're in the Which is why I'm now a <laughs> lawyer. But no, seriously, it's um, actually incredibly useful just in terms of life. Because as a law student, one of the things that everybody keeps saying is, oh, I bought my stereo and da 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 da. And actually, if you do commercial law, you'll know what the answer is, okay? Um, so I'm here to talk about Law of Disarmament, which is one of the summer school offerings um, this summer. So the classes are going to be four hours a week on a Wednesday and Friday. Um, so it's going to be sort of pretty intense across those weeks, but actually that I'm hoping will give, you know, sort of quite a nice um, uh, kind of feeling in the class in terms of we'll be meeting so regularly. Um, it's the first time I've offered the course um, and I've been waiting for years to teach it. It's like my mm -hmm. pet thing. Um, so I am pretty excited. Although the assessment hasn't been approved, um, I am hoping to have some form of a written, so not a sort of traditional closed book exam at the end, but some kind of a written um, piece of work, uh, whether we call that a take home exam or whether we call that a research essay, I'm not entirely sure it'll need to fit in. One of the things we're being really conscious of in the summer school is that the assessments are properly staggered, so it does. if you're doing more than one course that it doesn't end up um, being hideous. So with those practicalities out of the way, you can see in the handbook what I've said about my course description and the um, content outline. I think it might be useful if I um, maybe say to you a few words about what I see as the kind of themes across the course. Um, so a really important theme is the role of law in disarmament um, because in fact it's relatively unusual. Um, there's only one or two places around the world that teach a course in disarmament law. You will find lots of it in security studies or international relations. So what do lawyers have to say um, about disarmament? And one of the obvious things of course is that when disarmament agreements are reached they are treaties and so that that is an instrument of international law so in that sense lawyers need to be involved but in fact um, we will see that there's a lot of really interesting um, legal questions um, in terms of how disarmament works and in what context it works and so on. A second overarching theme is the changing understandings of security. So international lawyers have tended to look at security in a very monochrome kind of way. So we think about Syria or we think about Iraq or we think about Afghanistan, um, but in fact security is very multifaceted and when we start looking at the transfer of weapons or the need to eliminate or reduce control or track weapons, that our sensibilities of securities might change. We're coming to a point where we find some categories of weapons um, horrible and offensive, perhaps immoral, and we will be looking at, well, why do we think um, and what does it say about us to say, for example, that chemical weapons are unacceptable, but nuclear weapons are acceptable? Why is that and what role does law play in those perceptions? Um, and then that will lead us to a third team, a theme of the course, which is how norms develop. So again, generally speaking with lawyers, the traditional way is we're kind of not really interested until we have a treaty or we see it as customary international law. We don't really take any notice of what comes before that and what comes afterwards. That's the bit that we tend to obsess about I would even say and in this course we're looking at something much more broadly than simply treaty making or customary international law. 
Um, so those are sort of cross themes. You'll see that there isn't a prerequisite for you to have done international law, but if you have done international law, this is the kind of course that you're likely to be interested in. But I will not be assuming that everybody has. And if people need a little bit of a pick-me-up, I will be providing some guided readings um, at the very start. Or if you wanted to get into those before the course happened, you would be more than welcome to email me or come and see me to talk about that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to spending my summer in the classroom, um, and I hope that you guys are too. Thank you. So Law of Disarmament is a summer school course. Aspects of Iwi Governance, also a summer school 10-point course. Page 34 in your booklets. Thank you. Uh, Kia ora mai tātou, a hoi anō uh, ko te aupare duza hau nō Ngāti Purau, Ngāti Rangitihi, Ngāti Whakaue, a he roia ki Chapman Trip, ki te taha o Tōku Huamahi, a uh, Greer Fredrickson. Uh, Greer and I are Senior Associates at Chapman Trip and we are going to be part of the uh, Team Teach team for the Chapman Trip presented uh, aspects of iwi governance. Um, we build to six minute units and so we are going to stick to our three minutes here, um, but encourage you all to read um, the course outline and um, then uh, get in touch with either of us. You can look us up online if you do have questions about the course. Uh, so similar to Tras's uh, course, we are over four weeks and twice a week, uh, th Tuesdays and Thursdays. So similarly, quite an intense course um, but again, we hope that having that contact time uh, and doing it over summer means that we'll be able to build up quite a bit of rapport with, with you who, um, who choose to attend with us. Uh, as a broad overview, this is the kind of work that we do day to day, so it does give you a bit of a practical insight into what lawyers uh, do do. We're in the commercial team, so it has a lot of commercial aspects to it, which, which Greer will elaborate on. Um, and it will just give you a bit more of an oversight and insight into what people mean when they talk about the iwi economy. So um, you might have heard about treaty settlements and um, that's what David would talk about in contemporary treaty issues. Um, but what we're talking about is where the rubber hits the road and people actually have to start making decisions about um, how they manage those those treaty assets. So it's an important part of the fabric of Aotearoa um, and everybody who does it has great things to say. So um, no mai, hand over to Greer. Thank you. So um, as Te Aupere said, it's a team taught course um, taught by senior practitioners from Chapman Trip. We're teaching you about the work that we do every day. Um, there's a bit of variety in your week, so yes, we'll see you twice a week and for three hours at a time. Um, but on a Tuesday, you will hear about the corporate aspects of, of what we're looking at, and on a Thursday, you'll hear about tax. But don't get frightened by the concept of tax, it's tax taught in a very practical way. Um, what we do across the course is we look at all aspects um, through legal governance, charities law, and also tax of some of the main um, structures that iwi, hapu and post-settlement governance entities and iwi businesses use to actually manage their assets and participate in that iwi economy that Te Apri was talking about. So we will look at companies, limited partnerships, trusts, joint ventures, all, all manner of legal entities, generally focused through um, case studies examples like Waikato Tainui and, and how they operate their structure, Ngāti Whātua Orake, so something a little bit closer to home. And, and through those case studies we can, we can bring you along on the journey of how some of these entities actually get used in practice. The only um, prerequisites are just the, st the, the part two papers, so you don't have to have done company law, for example, or equity to take this paper. Um, and the same as Trussa, we're happy to give you um, some guidance on things you might want to read first if, if you're really keen, but no prerequisite for that either. Does anyone have any questions? That's cool. That's us. Or you, Stephen. <laughs> Okay, so keeping the best to last, we'll um, vary the schedule a little so we can get back on track. So I'll defer privacy law and ask Dr. Anna Hood to address us about refugee law. 
best or last. I don't Indeed. know that. <laughs> Refugee Laws, page 59. Um, hi everyone, I'm Anna. And next year, for the first time, we're offering an entire semester course on Refugee Law. In the past, it's always been Immigration and Refugee Law. Immigration Law is great, but um, decided it needs to split the two subjects because there's so much in both of them that we need to be able to have entire courses on both. So. Um, I'm sure you're all very aware that at the moment we are in the midst of a huge refugee crisis around the world. We currently have around 60 million displaced people. Um, it's one of the highest numbers in history and it's causing huge problems for a large number of communities. And what we do in this course is look at a range of different aspects of the crisis and of um, refugee issues. So we'll start out by looking at New at what happens in New Zealand when people apply for refugee status and what our laws are about who a refugee is. Um, interestingly, although there are 60 million people who are displaced from their homes, a very small number of them actually qualify as refugees. Refugee law has a whole lot of different elements to it, so we'll work through that so you work out who's in and who's out. Um, we're then going to look more broadly at the system and look at some of the different mechanisms that are in play around the world at the moment um, for how we deal with refugees. So what are the, what's happening in Europe at the moment in terms of the um, refugees coming out of Syria and the pr um, processes that have been put in place to try and deter some of them and turn them back and split them between different countries. We'll look at the policies and legality of what's happening there. We'll also do things that look at um, a bit closer to home and um, detention regimes that have been set up in Australia and the Pacific for refugees um, and get, have a detailed look about those sorts of issues. So the course offers both um, some sort of hard doctrinal law and what's going on and so you understand how to be a refugee lawyer, but it also offers a chance to look at some of the policies and to critique some of the things going on because I think this is an area where we desperately need people to be thinking really critically about the system we have and about where we're going and what's happening because quite frankly the system at the moment is broken in many, many ways. Um, that's sort of the substance. It's on first semester. It's going to be twice a week, so it'll be an hour and a half each class. Um, the assessment will be 30% internal and 70% exam. 30% I haven't totally worked out yet, but um, I've been hearing good things about lecturers this semester who have sort of given different hand in times and done a range of different forms of assessment. So I'm interested to think about those sort of things and interested if you have particular thoughts, um, you're welcome to get in touch over the next month or two and have influence into that. Um, finally, I guess the other thing that I try and do in this course and done, did last year with immigration and refugee law is to bring in some people um, who are practicing in the field, both in New Zealand and internationally. Um, we have some amazing um, practitioners and so we do try and get them to come into the classroom so that you have a really good understanding of what's happening out um, in practice and also last year we had a lot of people being set up into different internships and even if you get in different job positions so definitely interested in ensuring that you are seeing what's happening in the real world as well as um, the academic side. Questions? Awesome, I hope to see you next year. Um, Mondays and Thursdays, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Anna. So that was a timely arrival, Joe. Yes, it's you, <laughs> Professor Joe Manning. <laughs> Healthcare law, page 44 in your booklet. Well, you're having a long afternoon, aren't you? Lucky you. Well, um, healthcare law, uh, offered in the first semester next year, it's co-taught between me and Ron Patterson, who teaches about 10 lectures. Um, and he gives a series of lectures on the code of patients' rights and the health and disability commissioner regime. Having been a former health and disability commissioner, um, it is scarcely anyone except another health and disability commissioner to uh, deliver those lectures. Um, we do a number of topics, they, these can change from year to year, but here's an indication of some of which are taught. Um, we often start with a study of the Cartwright inquiry into um, the unfortunate experiment at National Women's Hospital which occurred in the late 80s in New Zealand and was a watershed event. 
um, we look, there's an introduction to <coughs> medical ethics and we look at how those ethics and the conflict between different ethical theories are played out in actual legal cases. Um, we look at forms of accountability from the Health and Disability Commissioner's jurisdiction to disciplinary processes and another avenue which is about civil action before the um, Human Rights Review Tribunal. Um, there's a short section on ACC treatment injury. A key topic in this area is consent to medical treatment and what constitutes a valid legal consent to medical treatment and that involves a study of competence, um, voluntariness <laughs> and what it is meant by a truly informed consent to medical treatment. Um, we look at in what circumstances a health professional can give treatment to somebody who's not competent to consent. So uh, an incompetent adult or a child who's not competent to consent. Um, rationing is an ever-present uh, topic or is an ever-present reality in the delivery of health services. So there's often a section on rationing and legal challenges to rationing decisions, denying people treatment. Uh, the last topic tends to involve the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment or euthanasia. So this year's class, we looked at the decision in Canada in Carter against the Attorney General and compared it to the decision, the recent decision in SEALS in New Zealand uh, and contrasted the, um, the reasons for decisions. Um, open book exam, two hours. The compulsory on-course assessment element this year was a test, a 30-minute test, a few weeks into the course. We may well do that again this year. Um, medical legal problems, should no, I talk about no, that? Not the honest, thank you. Not the honest. Well, it is the, this is the best elective course offered in the faculty, and all my colleagues agree. So, <laughs> Except for one. <laughs> so I hope to see some of you there next time. Best. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Janet. So, Janet, please. Professor Janet McLean. Now, Janet, you're going to talk about admin law as well as your advanced study. I've got to talk oh, about three. Okay. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks very much, um, Stephen. Um, I'm teaching Medical Legal Theory 1. This year called Advanced Public Law, doesn't that sound dull? It's not <laughs> dull, it's, um, uh, so it'll be a 10 point course next year. And we talk about what do we expect out of a constitution? Does const do constitutions help us reach agreement or do they create more disagreement? How do you get agreement when there are really severely um, divided societies? We look at a range of different um, kinds of constitution, we look at um, forms of rights uh, protection and we look at the comparative merits of different forms of rights protection so we look at the Canadian um, way of protecting rights, we look at the European ways of connect, uh, protecting rights, we look at what should be in rights protections. Um, this year we've got uh, just next week Sir Jeffrey Palmer coming to talk about his proposed constitution uh, and all my students will be armed to ask him the really difficult questions about what's in it, what should be in it, how we get it, if we should get it, and so on. Um, the, uh, so I haven't quite worked out what I'm going to do in terms of um, how I examine that next year. This year there was an opinion where you took a case that had been decided and you changed the rights protection model and then wrote the judgment as if you were a judge in a different um, constitutional framework, uh, which people seem to really enjoy. And sometimes, lo and behold, the result was no different, as well as sometimes the results were radically different. Um, so that's uh, comparative constitutional law. It's um, theoretical. It's the sort of thing people who like artsy sort of um, subjects like. Um, yes, there's some case law, but that's very much um, 
secondary to the theory and, and helps inform the theory but isn't the basis of the course. Second thing I'm teaching next year is administrative law um, and I'm co-teaching that with Dr. Jane Norton um, and it's the first time we'll be teaching that together. It's usually um, Hannah Wilberg who teaches that course and so we'll bring our own obsessions and enthusiasms to that course. Um, we want to look at what makes a good decision. How do bureaucratic decision ma makers work? How do corporate decision makers work? And how can uh, judicial review aid people to make better decisions? Uh, or in fact, might judicial review make decision making worse? Um, that could be a counterfactual. We want to look at the developing cutting edge bits of judicial review, we want to look at where legitimate expectations are going, where mistake of fact is going, uh, how rights frameworks are impacting on judicial review and how much deference courts um, will give to um, decision makers, especially in the terrorism space and in the allocation of resources space. Um, we want to look at the extension of judicial review of public law norms into the private sphere, into contracting um, and into um, commercial decision making of different kinds. So that's what that course is about. It's a 20 point course and it'll be in the first semester. That's quite a big commitment of time but um, you'll get us doing a double act and we are planning to teach that together all the way through. Um, and we plan to teach, I plan to teach both of these courses in a seminar format where there's a lot of participation, where you can follow your interests as much as possible and bring your interests to the table. So um, it's a great, uh, both classes will, a relatively small list on this is figures 30, 30, so you get a real chance for exchange. The third, um, of course I want to talk about is law and policy for Professor Jane Kelsey. She's at her mother's bedside at the moment, so she couldn't be here, she otherwise would. There's a handout that um, we've left at the front. Um, and some of you will have seen Jane on radio, television. She's a global commentator on neoliberalism, on the TPP, on the sorts of policy changes that have swept the globe. Uh, she's really articulate and engaged and at the cutting edge uh, and this is a course about doing policy and how policy is done, how policy relates to law um, and the case studies that they've looked at in the past or this year have been at terrorism laws, at privatisation of SOEs, at the Auckland Super City, at Smoke Free Aotearoa 2025, uh, and in an election year next year, they'll be looking at a lot of potential um, election issues, uh, particularly housing policy. I know that it's not uh, very common for law students to admit they want a political career where it, while they're at law school, but if you do want a political career, this is the course for you. Uh, this is someone who really knows how uh, policy is made behind the scenes, how the policy making process works, how the better regulation, less regulation framework works and how regulatory impact statements work. Uh, I promise that that will be a very critical and engaging um, course and this year it, uh, the evaluation featured a um, group case study, 30%, a 5,000 word research paper based on that case study or a closed book to our exam, the, only, the last two uh, alternatives, but you all have to participate in our group case study. That's all three, uh, makes me tired thinking about next year, but uh, lots of public law offerings. Um. Thank you, Janet. So the history of law of obligations, which is shown on the schedule as aspects of legal history, is taught by Professor Warren Swain. It's a summer school course, and it's in your booklets at page 50. Um, you will note that there are uh, two legal history courses. One can't have too much legal history, but perhaps they ought not to be confused. Uh, for information, uh, the course that I am offering in the summer 
will be taught from the 11th of January uh, into uh, February, uh, Thursday the 16th of February, um, just after Valentine's Day. Um, <laughs> And we'll be taught between 5 and 7 in the evening uh, on those days, so there'll be four hours a week. Uh, so talk uh, kind of semi-intensively, I suppose. Um, the subject matter of this course uh, is the history of the law of obligations, by which I mean the history of contract and tort and unjust enrichment. We will cover the period from the Middle Ages until the uh, 19th century. Um, this course is fundamentally about the history of legal doctrine as represented in primary sources, namely uh, law books, uh, case reports, yearbook reports, as well as the secondary literature. It's important for those taking this course not to be frightened of two things, um, a large amount of reading and uh, being able to engage with the primary sources. Um, those primary sources are, you'll be pleased to know, available in English, so I don't expect you to know more French or Latin. Um, and those primary sources are easily available online through a, a series of databases, so that stuff is now quite accessible. Um, this course will be taught in seminars, uh, and it's the expectation that the seminar will be run by me talking for some of it and uh, you to engage with the materials on prior reading uh, afterwards. Um, as far as the uh, assessment is concerned, this is a 10 point course. The assessment is by virtue of a 5,000 word essay which is based on uh, titles that I give you, or I am happy that you choose a topic, providing it falls within the purview of the course, um, in order to give maximum flexibility as far as the assessment is concerned. Um, I will, uh, it's my practice with that, in order to assist you to write a good assessment to ask you to provide an optional um, outline of your uh, assessment, uh, which isn't part of the grading process, but to give you a sense of direction and feedback before you write the actual assessment. Does anyone have any questions? No, thanks very much. Hi, thank you, Warren. So we heard earlier from Craig Aleph about international tax. Michael Littlewood teaches the tax law course, which is offered in both semesters, and advanced tax in the second semester, and those entries are on pages 24 and 27. Thank you, Michael. To um, study tax or not study tax, I suppose, is a difficult question. What it comes down to is whether or not you wish to join the um, financial and intellectual elite of the legal profession. If you do, then obviously that means being a tax specialist, that requires you to do the, uh, the basic tax course and possibly also the advanced, well certainly also the advanced tax course and possibly also Craig Ellis' uh, course as well. Yeah. Um, no, but I'll come and speak a bit, stand a bit closer and I'll speak a bit louder. Um, of course, you're just, you uh, may choose not to be a um, a tax specialist, but you may choose some other area of legal practice, uh, such as being a commercial lawyer of some kind, or perhaps a property lawyer of some kind. If you want to do either of those, equally obviously, you will need to know something about tax, because your clients will be buying and selling real estate, or buying and selling companies, or developing real estate, those kind of things. All of that has tax consequences to it. You might think you can escape tax, um, which you can by, for example, doing family law or uh, criminal law, but even if you want to be a criminal lawyer, bear in mind there's only three kinds of criminals who've got any money, and that's drug dealers, drunk drivers, and tax evaders. So <laughs> take your pick on that. The way the job market works is um, <coughs> students get the best grades, mostly get jobs with the big law firms, which are the ones that practice tax. Grades aren't quite so good, get a job with a big accounting firm. Uh, grades aren't quite so good. Again, um, the, the options include the Inland Revenue Department. The Inland Revenue Department is a uh, large organisation, a major employer, employs lots of lawyers. 
the way it works is after a couple of years, uh, whoever got the job at Russell McVeigh uh, tends to leave, because then they go off to London or New York or Hong Kong or somewhere. That creates a vacancy. Everybody moves up one. Um, eventually what happens, you work for the Inland Revenue and you learn all their secrets. After you've been doing that for a couple of years, then Russell McVeigh are prepared to pay you quite a lot of money um, for you to come and work for them and share the secrets. The downside is, after you've spent a couple of years working in the Inland Revenue Department, you might have um, uh, got used to going home at five o'clock and even more importantly, you might be um, develop a taste for wearing a cardigan to work. Uh, obviously, that disqualifies you from uh, working at Russell McVeigh. The, the basic, tax course, um, basic tax course covers the, the whole structure of the tax system, plus looking in a bit more detail at uh, particular aspects of it. Um, start off with tax policy, uh, look at, looking at questions such as, uh, for example, which is better, income tax or GST, those being the two main taxes in our system. I know probably you've got some immediate off the top of your head theory about which is better, income tax or GST. My aim, however, is that you should be able to address that question um, on some theoretically sound basis rather than just kind of shooting your mouth off about it. Um, <clears throat> so we do some uh, introductory policy work then looking at the, the, the whole of the tax system, meaning uh, the whole of income tax, the whole of GST. Um, obviously uh, not in great depth, but selected topics in great depth. Uh, such as, for example, the very troublesome distinction between tax avoidance, which is basically those things you're allowed to do so as to not pay as much tax, and tax evasion, which are those things that if you do then you cross the line and um, go to jail. Um, uh, what else? Um, apart from the, um, the, the professional pecuniary benefits of studying tax, Advantages include that you can't really understand the legal system at all, or the political system at all, or the economy at all, unless you understand how the tax system works. So, so tax is both a very specialised subset of uh, commercial law and fundamentally important to the way that the constitution, the legal system, and the political system operate. For example, uh, Magna Carta, which you might have heard of probably in constitutional law, what the constitution is about from before Magna Carta up until now including is what is the state's power of taxation. Um, US government have got plans in the event of a nuclear holocaust, they've got plans that will ensure the um, survival of the um, US federal tax department. The rest of the government <laughs> that, you know, can fall apart. As long as the tax department and the army are operating, then they stay in business. Um, uh, what else do I need? I've got any time to no, the, the end. Anyone problem. got any questions? So well, that's enough. All right. Thank you. I see some of you, I hope, uh, next semester and uh, others of you uh, the semester after that. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Stephen. So, second last course is competition law. The details for that are on page 29, and Chris Noonan teaches it. Thank you, Chris. Hi, and I'm um, Chris, as Stephen says, and competition law is my subject. Um, What's competition law? Competition law is really about the law that's designed to protect sort of competition in markets. And um, we sort of look at a number of different things. Most of it's based on the commissaire. So we're looking at agreements that restrict competition, so price fixing, cartels of other sorts. Also agreements between sort of um, suppliers and, and their customers, and how that can actually affect competition in the market, sort of use of a dominant position and sort of mergers that will restrict competition. The subject's probably a little different from some of the other subjects you look at in law school because we sort of very much integrate a sort of a, a, an economic side to looking at the law as well. And you don't have to have done economics at all to actually do competition law, but we sort of very much think about sort of what the economic rationale and the ideas behind competition law are and the particular decisions that are made as well. So it's, it gives you a different perspective of law compared to what you've looked at in other subjects as well. And so sort of that sort of approach to law and thinking about markets and the integration of law and economics also is relevant for other subjects as well, other areas of regulation or business that you may find yourself involved in throughout your life as well. What else have I got to say? Um, not a lot, but any questions? Thank you. Thank you. So I said we keep the best to last, and the best is, of course, privacy law. Um, so just very briefly on that elective, details of which are on page 59 in your course book, uh, privacy law is offered only every second or third year, not every year. So it was last offered as an undergraduate elective in 2014, and it will be offered in the first semester next year. 
and it will almost certainly not be offered in 2018. So if you're in part three next year and you think you might defer it to the year after, chances are it won't be there, so grab it while it's going, if you're interested. Uh, privacy law in New Zealand is underdeveloped, and one of the reasons that it's underdeveloped is because there is no clear idea of what the law is trying to protect. So in the first part of this 10-point course, which has only 24 hours of class, two hours a week, Tuesday and Thursday mornings, um, we look at the concept of privacy, um, the interests with which privacy competes, and some sources of privacy law. So that's the first three classes. Up until the mid-semester break, the rest of the course is concerned with the common law's response. So we have in New Zealand two different privacy torts. We ask ourselves, do we actually need them both? Do they need any refinement? Do we need any more privacy torts? The Americans have four. Are the third and fourth of the American ones of interest to us? Is there still a need within our common law for some privacy protection? And to get a handle on that, we also look to the UK, Canada and Australia, those cognate jurisdictions to see how they go about protecting privacy law through the courts. So the first half of the course is common law focused. The second half looks at uh, statutory protection of privacy and we have an array of statutory provisions in New Zealand, the Privacy Act obviously, which is in for a major overhaul, and various provisions scattered around different statutes, but they don't provide comprehensive coverage. And so we think about whether any more statutory protection is needed or can the common law take up the slack. And then in the last few classes, we begin to apply our understanding of privacy law in various areas, various contexts, various industries, and so on. The way the course is assessed, given that it's only a 10-point course, um, it has, at the end, either a two-hour exam, weighted as 80%, or a research paper in lieu of that exam on any privacy topic, and that would be 4,000 words, so that would satisfy that sustained writing requirement. So either a research paper or an exam at the end, 80%. The other 20% comes from a 1,000 word written assignment during the semester, and I say during the semester because I'll set three or four different topics scattered throughout the semester, and you can choose any one according to what is convenient for you to fit around your other commitments. Uh, so usually, because this is a developing area and there's a lot of interest, there is scope, as I said, for students to write research papers on topics of interest. Usually about 30-40% of the class choose to do so, otherwise the exam um, itself, the alternative, would have a fair measure of choice within it, including an opportunity to talk about any particular aspect of privacy that you might be interested in or motivated about. Okay, any questions? Yes? Just in terms of all those Yeah. The yep. At what point in the course do you make that decision? Um, it, normally, if you are going to present a research paper in lieu of exam at the end, you need to have decided on your topic and had it approved by the end of the fourth week. So you've got the first third of the semester to say, well, I don't want to sit the exam, I'd rather avoid the exam and just focus on my particular interest. And, and you usually get like an overview of the kinds of things that you could Yeah and what the possibilities are. And if you're stuck for an idea and you still want to do a research paper, undoubtedly the teacher will be able to suggest a variety of topics to you, as I would be happy to do in respect of privacy. Okay, well, any questions or criticisms or comments about anything that we've covered this afternoon? Any of that generic stuff that may still be unclear? Yeah. No, they don't. Um, so, while if you look at the way in which the, hand, uh, the, sort of the prospectus or the handbook set out the degree structure, it suggests that you must do uh, land equity, juris, law 399, and ethics in part three. There is no necessity to do that. There's a very good reason to do land and equity in part three. Well, two good reasons. One is that they are year long. And if you were to defer either of them, that would preclude the possibility of going on exchange in part four and about 25% of our students do go on exchange in part four. So land and equity at least should be done in part three. As for Juris, Law 399 and Ethics, you need to do them before you finish your degree, but they don't have to be in your part three year. They can be deferred. And those three courses are all offered in both the first and second semester each year. So you could put off Ethics if you wanted until your final semester. And the same applies to Juris and to Law 399 as well. 
there's not a limit on the number of papers you can do in a semester. There's a limit on the number of points. That's just a university-wide limit, and that is a maximum of 80 points in the first semester, 80 points in the second semester, 30 points in summer school. So that's 80 plus 80 plus 30. But there's an annual limit of 170. If you're really keen to do more than 80 points in a semester, then the faculty or the associate dean has the discretion to override the points limits and graduate concession. If you want to do more than 170 points in the year as a whole, then you have to make a special application to the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, and it's hard to get approval for that. So it's not the number of courses, it's, it's the points, bearing in mind that the courses have different weightings. Anything else? Yeah? Um, do you know when the assessing structure for the courses will be confirmed? Um, it's pretty much settled for most courses, so there are just a few details. So it's unfortunate that it says all the way through here to be confirmed. Um, the, the questions are only around where there is a proposal to have a test in an elective course. It just gets very difficult to schedule a whole lot of tests, given that we've got to do it also for all the compulsory courses in part two, and for land and equity in part three, and for law and society, and for legal method. So um, where there has been a test in an elective course this year, that may be replaced by a written assignment. There's one other refinement for next year. This was the first year where we had compulsory coursework in all of our electives, and there were some teething problems, and in particular there were some bottlenecks where several assignments would be due around the same time. So we're looking at spreading them out more over the semester. We're looking at doing more widely what I'm proposing with privacy and to give a variety of assignments and say you've got to do one, but you choose which one, and the timing is up to you. Um, as far as tests are concerned, there may be tests, but that's unlikely. Um, most of the details will be settled within the next week or two, and hopefully by the time, therefore, that you come to enrol online, which you can do, as I said, from the 7th of November, that information will all be available. Nothing else? Okay, well then, just leave, it remains for me to thank you for your attendance and your attention throughout the two hours. Good luck with your selection of courses for next year.